Uh, it was seven times, Jewel, seven times. <laughs> taste the biscuit, Jewel. Taste the goodness of the biscuit. Uh, I'm I'm still trying to install my own personal glory hole in my house. Anyway, I'm <laughs> resident of Cal. <laughs> I think he. I do not think that. Yeah, means he does not know what that means. means. Um, that's, I don't think know. he knows the full meaning of it because. Cool, man. In England, oh boy. In no, England, it refers to a little closet. Which when is, Lieutenant which is, General Brigadier Nordstrom. Winthrop the Eighth, or whoever the Dark Shadows Club guy is, gets a hold of you over this. Oh boy! <laughs> I bet. I bet. I'm resident of Collinwood, Joel Sains. Uh, that's my buddy Gordon Amoski. That's my buddy Patrick McRae. We're here to talk Dark Shadow sets uh, <laughs> and have fun doing it. I gotta ask you guys this because Dark Shadows in the beginning. They, yes, they did sets, but they did on location shots, too, really well. And they mixed the two really well. So what did you guys think of, you know, Dark Shadows in the beginning? Because you had Alexandra walking out of the Seaview Terrace, and they did, like, a tracking yeah. shot a bit. And then they'd cut away to where she was at, like, at Willow's Hill. What did you guys think of the combination of sets and actual shot locations? I think it looked awful. I think it I think we're all supposed to say, oh, how wonderful it looks. And it's good that yes, there are a lot of architectural features intrinsic to Seaview Terrace that are also intrinsic to the old house, or to, to well, both the old house and Collinwood, uh, but especially Collinwood. And I mean, I have stood under that, you know, portico and and I've been at those doors, and it's it's really a transcendent experience. Um, having said that, if if there's anything that looks worse than 1966 era chroma key, it's grainy 1966 era 16 millimeter film that uh, looks like a stag film made by the Amish, where just nothing's going to go on. Uh, then that has that is that is chroma keyed, and it just it's it's like it it looks real. It's two different styles of filmmaking. They look really awkward. Um, the the other than some architectural details here and there, they, they don't fit. They're fun. They're kind of geeky and goofy. But there's a reason why the show dropped them after a while, and that's just that they don't really need them, and it does pull you out of that world. I think I'm just gonna go for the go for the bold on that one, and that's just my opinion. Right, George. Yeah, I think they they don't they to me they they kind of jar. Like when I watched Black and White Doctor Who from the from the same period that did the same thing, they knew to keep location and film shots film and video shots video, so the 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 visual jarring isn't uh, too bad. Um, for example, I was watching uh, Tomb of the Cybermen on um, retro TV over the past few nights, and it's. Same deal, black and white with location, and and they blend kind of seamless, seamlessly. Although you can see where videos, video, films, film. I think with Dark Shadows, it's there isn't that sense for me. There isn't that sense of visual continuity between the outdoor shots and the indoor shots, where it doesn't. It feels like you could tell one's a set and one is a house. You, you know what I mean? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'll tell you something I really love, too, and I went back and watched this episode recently because I think I, I know I uploaded it here recently. When David is in the, in the, uh, where Maggie's work in the dining room or the dining area, because it's right in Counter. the hotel, and you see Roger Collins, Lewis Edmonds' character, like, like warming himself up because he's waiting for his cue to come in the door. And I thought that was so neat because you could see him. You could tell it's Lewis Edmond. <laughs> and another thing I love too, I love the fact that we get a tracking shot of Lewis Edmonds walking, not in that same episode, he's walking along the docks to go to work and he's waving at people. I, always thought I think, that I think Roger waved at a lot of people on the docks at all times of day. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, he was probably like, hello, random person. Hello, another random person. Hello, hello sailor. person who keeps me stocked in frost glass brandy sniffers. <laughs> I always thought that was so neat how they filmed that. Uh, it was a very Andy first. Griffith show moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed. Yeah, especially when Roger would run into Don Knotts as Barney Fife. You know, I loved the little crossovers they would do. It's so clever. Let me tell you, if if Barney Fife had gone to Collinsport and become its deputy, become Patterson's <laughs> deputy, and he would have had one silver bullet, you know, in his pocket that he always would have been fumbling to get into his pistol. <laughs> Mr. Collins, I... <laughs> I don't I don't think he would have qualified for the Collinsport Police Department. Um just saying. What 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 what, what bar is so low? That you could not qualify well, to work for George me, Patterson. Well, to me, the real qualification to work at the Collinsport Police Department, you sort of have to somewhat graduate from the the shadow school of you better be able to shoot people and hit just people, not glass, just people. Um, I mean, look, only stormtroopers are this accurate. Remember, remember when when Lily Loomis got shot? He's by Mag Yevon, sort of glass door. They don't yeah. hit the glass. They hit Willie Loomis. All that's of them. right. All, all the bullets. So and I they still it, don't kill him. Yeah, usually that, like, that's what ha- Yeah, that's what happens when you usually <laughs> aim the the gun barrel at a person. The bullets go into them. That's right. It's called physics. It's that simple. It, but they don't go into any place vital. <laughs> it's like set your pistols on stun, man. Oh God! Why? <laughs> I actually like how they do the on location and the sets. I always thought to me it looked really neat. It's something I appreciate that we get that atmosphere, dark shadows. Um, because again, one of my favorite sort of on the the on location is when Alexander's walking out of Sea View, and we get her walk, and we see somebody watching her. We see David watching her from the window, which I always thought was really neat. Because uh, they're shooting David Hennessy's David Collins looking out the window and watching her, um, which is really cool to me. Um, so is it after that, does he then go under his bed and find that, that pile of hidden magazines he stole from Roger? You know, the ones in the plain brown wrapper? <laughs> Listen, that was muscle and fitness, and it was a perfectly normal magazine. Millions of men. <laughs> Speaking of millions of men, I saw the weirdest parking bumper sticker today. I got to share this. I put it on Facebook because it was clearly put up by some homophobe. Oh, my but, God. but I know, I know, Joel. Uh, but he was so working against his own purposes. It was it was far more hilarious. And it said, only gay cops pull me over. Trying to unpack that statement and all of its implications and everything with it has left me scratching my head for hours. That's all I'm going to say. Back to David Hennessy watching Victoria. Yes. <laughs> well, you realize we're talking about anything but the steps. We're, we're, we're right now talking about buildings created in Newport and in Essex decades before. Well, we're going to get... Uh, I didn't want to just talk about the sets. I want to talk about the on location shots too, because to me that's a part of dark. There shadow. we go. Okay, I'm up to date. But, but so, so sorry for the confusion. But here's well, a question okay. for you guys: In the beginning episodes, what's a set that you really appreciated and enjoyed mostly? Was it the was it Collinwood itself? Was it the drawing room? Was it Victoria's room? Maybe maybe uh, Widow you know, Widow's Hill a bit. Um, well, any set when Victoria Winters was not on camera. That was my favorite oh, set. Oh, now, oh, now, okay. <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> this is a clear invitation to the dance. <laughs> um, uh, Betsy Durkin, I love you. Um, uh, Jewel, when you say in the beginning, yeah, the beginning. Of do you do you mean in the beginning of the series or when we first started watching? In the beginning of the series. Sorry for the. Okay. Knowledge. Oh, I mean, you know, uh, the foyer 
and those the the low camera angle that we're treated mm. to with the foyer at the very beginning um you know colin wood itself the the drawing room I mean, those are the first sets that we see mm. uh i really like sets like the like the dining room area and i think maybe we see the kitchen once yeah. uh in that in that early part of the show that's fun I, I i do wish we had kind of gone back to that although it makes the collinses less mythic i like mm. the idea that the collinses are so grand they don't have like a dinette mm. they have a dining room so elaborate no one wants to deal with it and so what they have is all so splendid that that no one wants to deal with it and so they just end up eating danishes on napkins in the drawing room yeah. that's my theory actually I mean, is, this is a, an actual theory about collinwood is that it is this fantastic biltmore like mansion and one of the things and this is something that i talked about with with mr perry is that uh the that the collinwood is so vast that like the Enterprise, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie, we never see it all in one shot. We never have a truly comprehensive feel for Collinwood so that they can always add on some other wing, some other dome, some other solarium or something like that. And, and, and so part and parcel of this is that the house is so large and so expensive to maintain and so easy to get lost in that even David doesn't go exploring. Mm-hmm. Even he's limited himself to just like one wing, and that's plenty. Mm-hmm. And that it's that that they have these facilities, but then no one wants to use them. Yeah, they probably got like a helipad and a swimming pool that opens up and lets a jet plane fly out. Well, an indoor. Um, that I think certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly a, a a fairly elaborate gym with an indoor pool, you know, like in Legacy or in Hell House, you know, steam room, stuff like that. Yeah. Jordan, what was your uh, favorite set in the beginning? I think my favorite sets were and still are kind of the, the, dry, the foyer in the drawing room because they have a very lived in quality. They look like they're actually part of somebody's house. Yes. They don't look like, hey, let's do put this in and this in. And it doesn't look like a studio made up to look like something. It looks like a a foyer. It looks like a drawing room. You could imagine that where the cameras would be would be another wall. And they feel because it's that deep, dark kind of woody tone. It feels lived in and it's it's it has that sense of history. It doesn't feel like. Like in the 1992 revision, the the mansion they used looked a little too clean. It looked a little too opulent. Whereas this one, it feels mm-hmm. like there's a, there's an age to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that mansion is called Greystone, mm-hmm. and it's in Los Angeles, and it appears in a lot of stuff, uh, including my favorite comedy, The Loved One, and the easiest and and they use it in the nine in the 2004. Uh, pilot as well. The easiest way to recognize Greystone is that black and white checked floor. Uh, that is, that's a dead giveaway that you're at Greystone. Um, and they ran it out for stuff. Um, I mean, you know, you do a whole book on the history of Greystone in movies. Uh, yeah, you know, that was, those were found spaces. And then you have the 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 thing that was built in England for the that Tim Burton short and um and again they quite missed the point. Sai Tomashoff was able to maybe somewhat out of necessity because he had so little room was somehow able to conjure this uh, allusion to grandeur, yeah. But keep it warm and intimate because the secret is, you know, we have to understand why Liz didn't go crazy living there and why this can be a home because that space and just depending on the lighting it can be all of those things that space the drawing room and the drawing room really is the bridge Mm -hmm. you know it is the bridge of the uss collinwood and that that bridge has to has to be adaptable to so many different emotional tones 
and it is, and they do, and that's that's part of the magic of it. Uh, what a fantastic set designer! Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love Widow's Hill. Obviously, is one of my favorite places that they shoot. I really enjoyed how they built that up. But another thing that I feel sort of is an unsomething. It's something I was talked about in my most recent videos that. The build to going to the West Wing was really done in the beginning episodes really well because when you see the door open by itself and then it shuts by itself and Elizabeth's answer is, oh, there's a spring lock and Victoria's trying to say, well, wait, wait a second, it shut by itself. And it's very slow and, spring. And then when, <laughs> when uh, they're searching for David, Caroline and Victoria are standing in the hallway and they, they see the door to the West Wing open and they hear keys and you see Joan Bennett sort of flash a smile because she realizes <laughs> she's supposed to scare them but it quickly evaporates and she comes out. It's really cool how they build. I really appreciate how they build going to the West Wing and how they do it. It's really because it's a lot of a camera work and be acting and i enjoy that very much but the kitchen scene you could sort of tell why they don't use the kitchen a whole bunch of times they do have a kitchen the reason i think they don't use it a bunch of times it's too well lit it, you can't i don't think you can make that kitchen mm -hmm. any darker than they, what they had it because you see this sort of lit like when there's windows over here and it's like I mean, I appreciate the effort for what they did with it because it looks cool and to have, you know, a place where you actually, other than the drawing room, but because, I mean, brand, there's a lot of brandy drinking going on in the drawing room, so why not? Um, well, no but, wonder Mrs. Johnson's in such a bad mood. She spends all of her time in this unflattering fluorescent lighting. <laughs> i tell you what, a place that really won me over there, too, and when I saw when they did the Collinsport jail, when they did the sheriff's office, Constable Jonas Carter's office, you got the desk, he's sitting there, and you got this jail. It's like, that is so small town fun. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's what you would imagine a jail in Collinsport to be, you know? Yeah. A desk yeah. and a room with bars and a place where a cop might. Like, wait, wait a minute, that's just a, a jail. That's just a policeman's office. I, I, is there something that is that to you is intrinsic to Collinwood or to Collinsport about that jail? <laughs> I just enjoy how it looked. I really did. It felt because living in a small town. You were on this side. Well, well, here's the thing. Like I talked about this with Halloween too, more than night he came home because people complained about there being a lackluster staff in the hospital the night Michael Myers enters it. Well, here's the thing. Haddonfield is supposed to be a small town. Well, I live in a small town called Connorsville, and I've been in that emergency room, and there's times there's been very few staff members in there. And when you look at when you look at Collinsport, that's supposed to be a small town, they both do a great job of having that type of setting when they're showing you these locations. It's very small. It feels confined. It feels like there's... This isn't a big, big city you're living in. This is a small coastal town. Even now, David they, would be cramped in that jail cell. <laughs> they do get summer people, which that's understandable. So, do, so did Amityville. So did the uh, Jaws. Kind of reminds me of that old Spinal Tap hit. Listen to what the summer people say. <laughs> <laughs> Jewel, listen, it's getting louder every day. <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> so remember that? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, so what did you guys, I'm trying to think of the, what did you guys think of when they finally uh, revealed, because they didn't, the, they had others, the graveyard location wasn't first eagle hill it was another cemetery what did you guys think of the first cemetery showing in dark shadows they're fine they're atmospheric they're mm -hmm. cemetery -ish. i mean these are pretty generic sets you know yeah. i mean it 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 fulfills its storytelling function 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think they really came alive in, in 1795 when you had Jeremiah coming up from the grave and, and the hand where, you know, some guy with a straw doing a bad scuba thing. But it's, yeah, I mean, they're workable. Yeah. What did you guys think of the old house when you first saw it? That's a wonderful triumph of of scenic design, especially the way that Tomashov is able to transform it mm-hmm. so many times uh, and, and let it evolve kind of naturally. That, I think, uh, wow, what a set. I mean, because it is such a wonderful, creepy... And it's and it's the opposite. It's the inversion of Collinwood. Yeah. You realize that, right? Mm-hmm. It's the mirror of Collinwood that you see the door kind of from the inside over here. But instead of everything being dominated by the stairs, no, the stairs go right past you. Yeah. And you're staring out the windows where normally the cameras would be mm-hmm. in Collinwood. So it it is Collinwood's mirror. Yeah, it also really looks like it could be an old house. You know, it, it, there's a sense of age to it. And I think the fact that it's that kind of, the way it's lit is kind of a, has more of a sour kind of unwelcoming tone to it. Whereas with Colin Wood, it, it's, it feels like the you wouldn't want to live there, but it fe- has a very lived in look. Or it's the old house, I think it, you could understand why maybe Joshua wanted to get out. It did have a lot of austerity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it really helps how old it looks, too. And when we get Josette coming out of her portrait, it just looks so amazing. I mean, the illusion is complete that this house has been abandoned for years. I think they, they communicate that it's a really large space also. Yeah. yeah. With, with very little... You know, I mean, it's about ninety percent basement. Yeah, that's something they do really well too. When when Matthew Morgan kidnaps Vicky and has her in that closet in the old house behind the bookshelf, that they because remember uh, Burke and Roger search the area. Oh, so does Joe. They search. They search the old house. So then they don't find Vicky. Yeah, but 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 does but does he taunt Victoria Winters with the chicken leg? That that's the important question. Oh cop. <laughs> Shiny buttons, Adam. Nah, I don't think that happened with Mickey. Uh, the chicken. Oh, we love oh the chicken my leg. God. Chicken leg. Gordon when... taunted you with the chicken leg at times. <laughs> What did she got? What did you guys? Because there is a quite difference how they do. When you first see Matthew Morgan's cottage, it looks completely different from when we see Laura move into it. What did you guys think of that change? Well, I don't think she would have stayed in there had it not. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, they, you, you know, they they got you know some guys from Home Depot and and you know they just redecorated it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, it's kind of like when you're when you're doing a soap opera on a limited budget, you're not going to do a different set for for everything. So it's probably like, yeah, let's just throw this around, throw throw these stuff in. It's good enough for Laura, you know. I mean, Matthew Morgan clearly let it go, but the the bones are there. Just get everything, Jewel. This is what you do: you get everything out of the cottage, and you clean it. You repair what you need to repair, and then you look at what you have, and you divide it into three. Well, you know how these things work. They got in Marie Kondo, and she took care of the whole thing. Well, they do add a nice fireplace for for sure. <laughs> Matthew just had that full of old sandwiches and things. That's where he kept his his non perishable condiments. Well, that's yeah, the and then there were the the magazines under the bed. Well, that's the thing. A complete too. collection of Jet magazine. Yeah, they added the Sears catalog. That's the thing with too, all the toys you... circled because that's what he wanted for Christmas. God, the toys in the Sears catalog were just great. Remember that? Yeah, just that was how that was, wonders. That 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 was that was that was the stuff. This is what my grandparents would do for Christmas. Instead of having me make a list, they'd hand me the Sears catalog and say, "Circle what you want." Um, and I circled quite a bit. Um, uh, when they looked at um, certain photos in the the in in the in the female section, they had Why questions. Is... But I said that I wanted phone numbers, not. You're doing research. 
Yeah. But Gordon, why do you want to marry Widow? <laughs> well, I don't. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it depends on and depends on the age of the widow, basically. <laughs> Oh my god. I really like what they do there too because when you see Matthew Morgan living there, you don't there's no fire, like he doesn't have the fireplace. It's completely changed. He has a kitchen when Victoria walks in, it's like right there. But when you see it with Laura, you see the fireplace, it's complete it looks like it's been completely moved around and updated. It's a very neat trick and a very neat tactic that they pull. I can tell you why. I can totally tell you why. Yeah. Well, it was either going to be, if Vicky had worked out, you know, she, and I don't mean in an exercise sense, um, but if Vicky had worked out, I think probably it would have been a logical place for Vicky to go, especially as David nears puberty and they just don't need that stuff. You know, she's going to want her own. She's going to meet a fella by then. She's going to want her own place. They will probably want to, you know, they can't imagine somebody like Burke Devlin. You know, it'd be somebody like Joe Haskell. Mm -hmm. And so this is a place for her to live. If not her, Carolyn might want to live there. Or eventually David. Uh, I think that there is this idea also that they probably have some cousins in other states who might want to visit and that Collinwood, frankly, is just too weird. And mm -hmm. it might be really advantageous for them to be able to have a guest, but say, you go over there. You don't, it's just, just, they, we like you too much to have you at Collinwood. We'll send a car. To, I mean, it's only a 10 minute walk, but we'll still, we'll send a car and have them come bring you back. Yeah, it's cheaper than a hotel. Um, you know, we 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 have it has a well stocked fridge. You know, Roger has invested in a lot of frosted glass brandy snifters. So if you need to remember though, too, when Victoria is going to marry Burke, they open up the West Wing. They start fixing that up for Victoria. They don't throw her and Burke into the cottage. No, Burke's not going to live that way. But Burke's also damned if he's going to live under Collinwood's roof. <laughs> uh, what did you guys think of the Blue Whale? It's a great set. Yeah, it's 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 the best CD bar I've never been to. It it does uh, it does a bunch of scenic things really well. It's on a diagonal, which works quite well. You know that basically you've got that the door at the apex coming down. It can be perpendicular if they wanted to, depending on where they stick the cameras, but it, it is on a good diagonal. Um, uh, the, you know, you can work the camera behind the bar uh, pretty easily. And, uh, and it's got a good sense of dimension and levels. And when you're designing a set, you want different action areas that give different people reasons to go there and where you can have breakout scenes and uh, and where you can have several different important pieces of action happen at once in close proximity, but have it be plausible that they don't know where the other ones are, that, that they're not totally aware of each other. So as a set, it works brilliantly. I mean, that's a master class in just designing a set is Blue Whale. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, the, you know, karaoke hadn't been invented yet, so trying to get a karaoke bar up there I mean, it just has that great kind of working class divey vibe where you have just as much kind of above board fun gatherings as you do like CD kind of let's get together and conspire type moments. Yeah. yeah. We, we do see the inside of uh, Burke's hotel room, which is supposed to be like <laughs> three bedrooms. Um, what did you guys think of the hotel itself? The Cold War modern sort of generic. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, it's design. it's it's a basic set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we get briefly inside Roger's office at the uh, cannery. I don't think we ever actually get the inside of the cannery itself in the uh, uh, which is interesting. The thing about Roger's office that's great is how he doesn't fit. 
how it just because because we know that Roger doesn't want to be living in Collinsport, that he had to come back because he ran out of money and that he is stuck basically in Edward's office, in his grandfather's office. And he does not want to be there. He's got these darts. That he's, uh, you, you can tell it's a, he wants to be in a real slick, you know, kind of Ken Adam type set. And I'm sure he's always after Liz to renovate the factory. And she's like, no, Roger, that's a useless expense. Mm-hmm. Go buy another skinny tie. Uh, did, well, did you notice, too, like, Roger and David are only living there a whole month before Victoria gets sent for <laughs> Roger. <Really? laughs> yeah. Wow. Roger's all, Roger, and da- Roger and David have only been there a month. And then Victoria shows up. God. So what was Roger doing? Was he just spending his money? I mean, he, well, he, Liz bought up Roger's share of the company. He tried to, he tried to sell it on the open market. A lot, a lot like how uh, Bruce Wayne's company, his parents' company was getting sold and Bruce Wayne buys all the shares and stuff. Well, Liz bought Roger's shares because if somebody else bought those shares, they'd own Roger's shares. So yeah. that's why Liz sort of cuts the electricity as she in the house up, so to speak, initially, because she's trying to cut money where she can, at least spending where she can, because she t- a lot of her money went into buying Roger's shares. Well, what do you know? So, I knew all this at one time. I just didn't remember it. It's, it helps. It helps to go back to the beginning, my friend. It, um, it does for story elements that have absolutely no salience to what happens once Barnabas enters the scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know what's also important, Jules? Sometimes you need to re. I think you have a point there because sometimes you have to rewatch something to reevaluate how good it is. Because you, you know what else is worth rewatching, and I think you should rewatch it, Jewel. And Patrick, I think you know where I'm going with this. Halloween ends. I think you have done a real disservice to that movie, Jewel. I, I think was about should... to say the beginning of Ghost Watch. Well, the, well, I, I see. We were, we were both kind of thinking along similar lines. Oh my god! Oh my god! In fact, Jewel, I think I think for for your next solo video. Watch Ghost Watch, watch Halloween Ends one right after the other, and do a compare and contrast. I think I, th- I think that would be an interesting, interesting monologue that, that to, to view. There is an interesting set set change when you look at it. Really, Doctor from Doctor Reeves' office from the beginning, it's like very small, and when you go to Doctor Woodard's office, it's very different. It's a very different look. What did you guys think of? Because when you see Dr. Uh, Reeves' office, no, which I, I, I honestly think it's just somebody being an original Superman fan. That's why the character's name is Reeves. Uh, what was Dr. Reeves' office? Dr. We're Reeves so office far was... into the weeds, we can't even see the coast of Maine. Dr. Reeves' office is <clears> where where uh, Roger went to get his uh, arm wrapped up after he had the accident. The bleeder valve was removed. And Dr. Reeves tells, uh, you know, you know what, you know what doesn't wait? Uh, babies, babies. Uh, so Dr. Reeves is our first doctor we meet actually in Collinsport. Um, they actually do mention him by name, uh, Dr. Reeves. Dr. Uh, Reeves by name, Dr. Reeves by reputation. (laughs) So his office is very small. Dr. Reeves. (laughs) His office is very small, at least to me, compared to what initially Dr. Woodard's office ended up looking like, and especially yeah. Dr. Uh, Hoffman's office, but that was a different thing. What did you guys think of Dr. Reeves' office? Like, very tiny. I, I think they had to slam together a doctor's office for, for a one scene, and it's like, okay, let's throw that over there. You know, but you know what a really impressing, impressive kind of doctor-scientist set was in Dark Shadows? Cyrus, Cyrus Longworth's basement lab. That or, was a good set. Or anything at that insane home of Dr. Lang mm-hmm. yeah. that mixed homey antiques with, with <laughs> mad science. <Yeah. laughs> that was a Dr. great set. Dr. Lang had a sick-ass house, uh, for Dr. sure. Who? Dr. Lang, Eric Lang. Oh, Dr. Lang, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah well, I thought you said Dr. Lamb. I'm like, who's Dr. Lamb? Oh, God. It was like Moreau. It was like it was like the island of Dr. Moreau. And in <laughs> fact, it's where Quentin Quentin uh, had grafted on the mutton chops, literally. Dr. Lamb <laughs> grafted on two two lamb legs. Speaking of the other doctor, what did you guys think of Dr. Julia Hoffman at Ridcliffe Sanitarium? This that set design, like her set. Yeah, her set. Yeah. These are pretty. I, uh, Jewel, I got to tell you, I I love these questions, and those are fairly generic sets. Mm -hmm. Those are sets that they put together out of other pieces very quickly, yeah. and they served a very business like <laughs> purpose. I think if for some reason uh, production needs because they were renting these pieces and stuff. If production needs had necessitated Dr. Hoffman's office to be what was later uh, Dr. Sizzlechest's office, what's his name? Uh, uh, the one tries to kill Barnabas, uh, Peter Turgeson, and then the guy before him. Come on. It's the doctor, Dr. Woodard. Yeah, <laughs> if it had been Dr. Woodard's office, if they had just flopped him around, ah, nobody would have cared. Dan Curtis wouldn't have, nah, this can't be Dr. Woodard's office. It's, it, no, I, it's... Those are those are all pretty generic, I, I think, because also we don't spend much time in them. Yeah. Uh, so he's not going to devote. Those are basically rentals. Yeah. yeah. Here's a fun one for you, uh, Nicholas Blair's house. What did you guys think? It's fun. I mean, uh, it's it's basically a redress of Dr. Lang's house. Yeah. It is. So it's fancy. It's it's mm -hmm. uh, you know I don't think Nicholas Blair was going to be around long enough for them to create the Nicholas Blair aesthetic. And he's a he's a he's an occultist in the closet. So you're not going to have a big altar in the middle of it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? you, yeah. It's, <laughs> By the TV trays. I mean, the, the one set that that was pretty consistent that I thought was really interesting was the the. Um, <clears throat> Evans house set that kept showing up like in the yes. atom. Because yeah, it's it's yeah, you know, because in Dark Shadows there's two kinds of sets. There's the the standing stuff that that you're going to be in every day where you want to connote a certain mo mood. And then you've got the throwaway kind of we just need a doctor's office so let's put that there. Yeah. Yeah, the Evans set I think is wonderful. It's homey, it's friendly. Uh, and it has it's dominated by an immense window, mm -hmm. which is so perfect for Sam, because he is even though he has his secrets, he's a much more open, transparent guy, in theory, than the Collinses. And that you know Maggie is a sunnier presence, and that you can imagine the psychology of people who would pick that as a house, and and who would live there, and how they would feel, and how they would be different than people who live you know with basically looking out of little portcullises and stained and, glass and stuff. Well, another thing, too, is you could understand why a painter would want natural sunlight coming in their window, too. Um, that's another that's a great thing. point. Yeah, it really is cool to see that 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 house, that cottage, the Evans cottage. It looks cool. And even Maggie, but it feels very, like, small-townish, too, because when you see Maggie's room, it's, very, it's not the largest room in the world. They feel like a very normal down to earth family when the sure very, very humble you know, a whole bunch of cameras in it <laughs> yeah, right. um, what did you guys think of the old house's uh basement the 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 cell that adam gets put in basically in maggie they do it they do a great job i mean it, they're just uh it you can understand why if you're worried about the Dutch and, uh, you know, Indians and all these other, uh, you know, pirates and so on and so forth, you know, hostels, why they would have those rooms to either lock up their stuff or lock them up or lock themselves up and, you know, unless they have bow and arrows. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just plausible enough that this is a secret they kind of keep tucked around that corner. Yeah, it works. Yeah, and it, it, it also looks like the place that's off, you know, it's in an off corner, so no one needs to know it. And you know, it's also a great place to taunt, to taunt people with chicken legs, you know, 
And he looked, chicken leg. You know, I mean, all Willie had to do was share his KFC. What is wrong with the man? He wasn't going to divest himself of that famous bowl. What did you guys think of Cal Patope's uh, lair in 1897? The old mill. Yeah, yes. that's right. It's, it's a wonderful siege mentality kind of uh, bunker that he's, that he's sort of jimmied in some fancy stuff. It's, it's marvelous. Yeah. I'll tell you a set that I never thought we would get, that we did get in 1897, was underneath Widow's Hill, like the caves underneath Widow's Hill. I thought that was really neat for 1897. Mm-hmm. What did you guys think? Uh, it would have been good if they had had pterodactyls in there that could have like, grabbed people when they were jumping off Widow's Hill and saved their lives. Yeah, or, or even mole people that would crawl around, they'd... They'd pick up the people who who jumped off Widow's Hill and use their magical healing powers. It'd be weird if they went down there and there was Thayer David's character from Journey to the Center of the Earth. That that would that would be actually be interesting. You could you could turn that into you know he's he's the long lost Collins Collins cousin Skippy Collins. <laughs> Chad, what what did you guys think of uh, Worthington Hall? It was a good set. Yeah. It was a school set. It was a good yeah. set. Let's flip this around for just a moment. Are there any other sets we have not discussed that stand out in our minds as as vital? I don't know. Because otherwise we're gonna like and what about that booth where Vicky went on that date with Frank Garner? And I'll tell you what, what I'm doing. I really enjoyed Rose Cottage uh, because of how it was built, how it was built up to, because they didn't know what it, remember, they couldn't, they weren't sure what it was. They weren't sure, wait, Rose Cottage, we never heard that of that building before, and you found out it was a different name building, too. Yeah, it was the old Magruder mansion. Yeah. Who was Magruder? Why we never find out? No, sure. Um, uh, yeah, Rose Cottage is good. The playroom is appropriately creepy mm-hmm. in the way it inf- infantilizes the kids. You know, it's it's not really a it's it's there's something oppressive about its just dead necrotic joy that's just kind of sitting there in this weird there's uh there, I mean there's Quentin's room full of nooks and crannies and mystery. I think that's great. Uh there is um, that wonderful lab where the the headless body is being uh, brought back in 1840. And that's a great set. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, atmospheric as, as hell. So those are all ones that really stand out to me. Yeah, yeah like for me, one of them, the, the one that stands out for me, that's not that, or is the parallel time room. I was about to say, yeah. Which is very striking. The other is the Collinswood laundry room where, you know, Vicky is doing towels and Carolyn comes in and they start having like a 10, 15 minute conversation about fabric softener. I think that is just brilliant. <laughs> God. Oh, Vicky, I need to do this dress. I got a stain on it. Well, why don't you put it in with this load? We'll just stay down here for a long time and no one will see. Okay, I still have my camisole on. That's all right. It's just us girls. Yes, it is. Oh, isn't that Joe Haskell? Help me with this zipper, Vicky. That scene that never <laughs> happened. <laughs> God. Uh, uh, what's you guys' I'm favorite? Uh, what's you guys' favorite secret passage? The one that we would have found out about in that scene I just was describing. <laughs> My favorite secret passage. I, probably David's passage into puberty with, uh, <laughs> with 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 Hallie Stokes that we never really saw. Um, I don't um, know. I... <laughs> I, I I think my favorite secret passage is the one that happened off screen where uh, Stokes and Julia would go to his private F pad and do the thing. <laughs> No, it's going no. too far. Oh, F pad is that next to F troop? Was, oh, was, were they next to Forrest Tucker and, and Larry Storch? Yeah, um, you know, 
The end yeah, of the Agarn would War show up movie. and and just ruin the whole thing. <laughs> I think uh, you know it. It was no secret who who was responsible for the passage on Fajita Night. <laughs> I'll give you one. Professor Stokes. Even though we don't see how it's exactly constructed, the secret passage out of Victoria's room that Barnabas actually uses at one point in time to get into that room, and Vicky uses it herself in 1795. I do, I do like the secret passage in the jail. That's how Sarah gets it, uh, gets Maggie out, which is really cool. It leads to what is the bottom of Widow's Hill. Um, they were just a lot, they were really creative of how they used sets that didn't exactly show. Like they don't show you how the like the secret passage inside the secret patches is, is constructed. They leave it to your own mind, which is in a lot of way really creative. Oh, Vicky, you got a gravy stain on your dress too. You might as well put that in this load of laundry also. <laughs> Okay, it's just us girls. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well. Tell me, Vicky, what do you like? Do you prefer Tide or do you prefer Oxidol? Well, I prefer Oxidol. Well, you know, Vicky, Tide gets more stains out. Especially How can you prove that? Sta- I'll show you. I have the Shroud of Turin. Now we're gonna wash half of it in Tide <laughs> and half of it in Oxidol. God. Yeah, and if you think it's it's horrible, I'm color, sorry for, for white. I'm just kidding. New <laughs> colors. Here are two dresses that I wore on two different dates with Joe Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm you just got, gonna stop right, right there. Do you, I don't. Even, I, I don't want to go anywhere yeah, where you just guys. Like, guys do you want to discuss the right stuff tomorrow? It's one of my favorite movies. I mean, I am happy to talk about it whenever you like. We could do it tomorrow. Gordon, you're free tomorrow? Yeah, I'm free tomorrow. All right. Is, is 1030 good? It sounds like you're being punished. The no, judge thinks, and you do your community service tomorrow. Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> uh, so uh, is there anything you guys want to add about the Dark Shadow sets before we get on out of here? Well, well, well before, before we go on, before we leave... I just want a point of clarification, Joel. Sure. You're you're not asking me to discuss the the new kids on the block song, the right stuff, correct? <laughs> That's correct. The movie, the right stuff. Okay, good. Oh my god, the new kids on the block. Oh my god. Oh my god. My company oh. defeated them in court, and no. I'll forever be. And comic books are forever protected by the First Amendment, as a result. Mm-hmm. So uh, long live Todd Warren. <laughs> uh, links to Kornowski's Amazon page is going to be in the description box. Link to Patrick McCray's Dark Shadow Stable Compound is going to be in the description box. We hope you guys enjoyed this video. You guys have a good night, and I'll see you tomorrow for the right stuff. Thank good you. Night. Please don't prosecute. <laughs> Bye.